Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Can You Hear Me, Can You See Me podcast. My name is Fatima Khan Shah and I am proud to be your West Yorkshire inclusivity champion. Now, I've always said that in West Yorkshire, we give value for money. And on this podcast, we absolutely are delivering. I haven't got just one or two or three panel members. I've got six uh, because we're talking about something that I think is a very important and topical issue. And that is belonging, particularly if you're coming from countries from around the world, contributing to the economy and health and care system of West Yorkshire. How do we make sure that people feel welcome, that they belong, but more importantly, thrive within our diverse sectors? So without further ado, I'm going to go around my screen and introduce you to the amazing guests that we've got on today. I'm going to start with Mahmoud Nawaz. Could you just introduce to the world what's your name? And as Silla Black says, where would you come from? Thank you, Fatima. So my name is Mahmoud Nawaz. Um, I am a non-executive director at the Mid Yorkshire Teaching NHS Trust covering Wakefield and North Kirk Lees. Uh, I am, uh, uh, for this month anyway, uh, the chair of Relate in Bradford and in Leeds, uh, the counselling charity, and I am the incoming chair from the 1st of February for Chesterfield Royal Hospital. And as we say, we are recording this podcast a little earlier than anticipated from the release. So when this podcast goes live, you'll be in a slightly different role. But we're really pleased that we've got you in this transitional period, they say, don't they, in the NHS. Um, another person I am absolutely delighted to meet today is Mai Mai, who um, is, is also very corporate and on brand today. Mai Mai, do you want to introduce yourself? Thank you, Fatima. My name is Mai Mai Del Rosario. And I was made in the Philippines, but developed in the UK. <laughs> Love Came it. To, yeah, I matron for education from um, Mid York's Teaching NHS Trust. I'm co-chair for Racial Equality Network within the Trust. And I also am part of the operating team for the Stay and Thrive Initiative commissioned by NHS England. Fabulous. And we're so pleased that you've managed to join us today, particularly to share some of your award winning trend setting work, which we're going to hear a little bit more about shortly. Talking of award winning trend setting work, Tim, as one of our national trend setters working in West Yorkshire's health and care partnership, do you want to tell us a little bit about the day job? Yes, thank you. So I'm Tim. I'm the Global Partnerships Programme Manager for West Yorkshire Integrated Care Board. So I'd like to say, Fatima, we're working closely with the uh, Global Partners at NHS England. Um, I'm really trying to um, establish West Yorkshire as a, a great global citizen. And by that, we really mean um, thinking about how we how people move to the NHS and social care via ethical and sustainable migratory pathways, which really look after work with health systems that can afford to people for people to migrate and to really look after people in their journey to to work in our in our system. Um, but also on global partnerships, really kind of um, trying to encourage partnerships that enable learning to be shared between between organisations and healthcare systems as well. So my day job is, is is as it sounds, quite global, like connecting with, with colleagues all over the and world. never a dull day, Tim, I suspect. <laughs> never really? a dull day. Uh, which is a woman with a very short concentration span, I find very attractive. <laughs> um, so, Tasneem, keeping with the NHS vibe, um, firstly, you are an absolute <laughs> national trendsetter when it comes to the ambulance sector and influencing inclusion. But for those of us that haven't come across you before, what's your name, where'd you come from? So I'm uh, Tasnim Ali. I'm a business manager and I work in the uh, 999 side of the uh, ambulance service in Yorkshire. Um, I've sort of been with the service now for 13 years, but I'm a nurse by background. And um, one of the things I've realised is I've uh, become quite clear in terms of uh, my purpose, my purpose in life. And it is about supporting and helping people. And I find myself doing that um, a lot sort of talent spotting supporting uh, where I can so it's a, a different different conversation uh, that I'd like to bring to the table today. Yeah and I think one of the themes we will explore is values particularly within this agenda because I think there's a very very close correlation and also the role that we've got as leaders to support people to belong and thrive wherever yeah. they come from I think is another one. Talking yeah. of belonging and thriving I mean I think I am the president of the Robin Tuddenham fan club. Anyone that I ever meet <laughs> that I talk about this guy I'm like he's absolutely incredible. You're the only member Fatty. I'm not the only <laughs> member but Robin for those of us that have not come across yet first of all where where have you been? Thank you. Um, but introduce uh, well, yourself. Okay, thanks, Fatima. Great to be here and see everyone and be part of this conversation. I'm Robin Tudnam. I'm the Chief Executive of Caldell Council. 
In West Yorkshire, I'm the place lead for the Integrated Care Board for Coldell, and I think relevant to this conversation, I'm the joint SRO for improving population health and keen to make Coldell a great place. And you'll see it in the background, it is quite a great place, but um, good it to be is. here, thank you. It is. I mean, for those of you that are wondering what is behind Robin Tottenham, it is the incredible nationally recognised Peace Hall, which is one of my happiest places on the planet. And if you haven't been already, do check it out because it is such an inspirational place and one of the most culturally renowned, I think, places for music. It's starting to be an up and coming place for concerts. So do do give it a, a go. Um, and then saving the best to last. Now, Shirley and I uh, go back a couple of years, mainly because she tried to get a restraining order from me stalking her on social media and Twitter. <laughs> Fan Girlinger is saying, I think you're incredible. I think the work you do is absolutely inspirational and also was instrumental in Bradford becoming the city of culture in 2025. Shirley, tell us a little bit about your role, not only as uh, the sort of leader with Within the University of Bradford, but also as a massive player when it comes to making Bradford the city that it is. Yeah, so <laughs> thanks, Fatima. So as you say, as the, as the Vice Chancellor of the University of Bradford, my, my key mission really is to deliver our vision, which is the world of equality of opportunity, where people want to and can make a difference. So I would add to your words of belong, thrive, I would say belong, thrive and make a difference. And I guess as a system leader in uh, Bradford, which is an amazing city, um, what we're trying to do collectively as system leaders is work together to make sure that all our people in all of the diverse communities across our city region can contribute and make a difference. And I don't personally think you can belong if you don't feel that you are making a difference in the way that you can and want to. And so that's what drives me individually and it's what's driving our university and it's what dr is driving us as a system of leaders uh, against a political uh, and environmental context of significant challenge. That challenge is global, national and regional. And I have to start off by saying it isn't getting any easier to drive that type of thinking, behaviours, hold on to the values of, of, of what that means and, and actually deliver on it. It is, it is increasingly challenging. It is. And weirdly, I was listening to another podcast on my way into the office this morning where they were exploring the concept of happiness and actually the importance of sometimes having to undergo adversity to fully appreciate the happiness. So for me, and it was it, it was a very uh, topical one because the job that we all do is very tough at the moment. The health and care system is under significant pressure. The academic sector is under significant pressure. There are loads of, of challenges that we're all dealing with as citizens of West Yorkshire. But the thing that really brought it home for me was actually nothing worth having is easy. So sometimes the struggle we go through means that when we get the, the fruits of success, we appreciate it a little bit more. But that does not mean that the adversity that we go through is any less challenging. And you're absolutely right to draw attention to that, Shirley, and hopefully we'll explore that a little bit more later. Now, Tim, I want to come to you first because you said something that I was really interested in. You talked about ethics, you talked about sustainability and you talked about values. And every person on this podcast has referred to values in their introduction to themselves. Obviously, uh, there was a real aspiration and focus on international recruitment because of the challenges we've got within the NHS and care workforce. Um, and it's one of the reasons why there's been a lot of focus and energy behind it. But for those of us that don't understand what ethical and sustainable resourcing means, what are you talking about? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I guess uh, we've always had a very international workforce in the NHS, which we which we, which we grateful for, and we I think we always will be. Um, uh, there's a lot of evidence to, behind um, people who make their way to this country. Sometimes though, um, have quite a potentially rocky journey, and uh, that can be. Um, evidence of multiple layers of agencies and people having a really really poor experience just means that by the time they by the time they arrive here um, they're really kind of maybe in some form of debt um, or their families in some form of debt back in their home country so uh, we're building on some work led by NHS England about around ethical uh, migratory pathways which are deliberately designed pathways where we look to partner with a healthcare a country or a healthcare system that perhaps will We'll have a deliberate model of uh, 
of over over training they 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 recognize that by training their workforce up here as nurses for example it offers people the opportunity for a profession and the opportunity to 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 my to my great um so for example we've got a partnership with the government of kerala who that is that is their modeling in kerala and in southern india so every year they require um 10,000 nurses uh, qualify in nurse in, in nursing in kerala but they track the 20,000 people qualify so we've got we've got a partnership with them um, so there's that kind of sustainability of, of supply from Kerala and willingness for the government to support the migration of their citizens via these ethical routes with partners such as ourselves in West Yorkshire. Because in Kerala, they, re they recognise that their citizens can be led on a sort of on a, on a rather wandering path through multiple layers of surveillance, like I said, which can be quite costly in terms of their financially and their experience as well. So this so direct, on that note, yeah. Tim, um, can you talk me through the journey that if I was a nurse in Kerala right now, what would be the process for me to come from Kerala to come and work in, say, I don't know, Kirklees? Yeah. <clears throat> so I mean, there, there is it's a rather unregulated market. So there are private agencies in Kerala, but OD, ODEPC are an agency of, of government, a government sponsored recruitment arm with, of the government of Kerala. And we've got a partnership with them and they they're quite well known in Kerala in the nursing community. They've got links to the nursing colleges and, and hospitals, private and, and public hospitals. So if a nurse is considering migration, ODPC would be advertising roles in Calderdale or Kirklees Trust. And that's what we're trying to do in, in West Yorkshire, raise the profile of this particular partnership. Yeah. So if you're going to do international recruitment, this is why we are championing um, our partners in Kerala on this eth this ethical route and sustainable um, supply as well. Yeah. So a, a nurse would see would be made available would be made aware of job opportunities in in West Yorkshire, um, and ODPC would be the only partner agency in that um, journey to our trust. They would link directly with the trust and they provide um, support with um, visas and flights um a, quite a, a comprehensive package of support really yeah um, for uh for a, a, a sort of a set nominal fee that's it's not for profit organization for, like i said for the government of kerala yeah so i mean and that might i guess roles for myself would be kind of troubleshoot um yeah. the process along the way but really it's for trust to develop a relationship with with the government of, with odpc government of kerala for example and how, property, how long yeah. would it take from seeing an application and arriving in say Halifax possibly three months but um really also, that's quite fast it can be we say roughly about two to three months all being well but you know it can be variable so realistically then the sort of psychological preparation of coming from a vibrant and warm country like India and a place like Kerala to then end up in I mean I'm you know I'm Halifax's number one fan but it's not the warmest part of the world is it I mean three months is a bit of a culture shock my my I mean you you mentioned you're doing quite a lot of work on supporting people with that transition of arriving within the UK just listening to Tim's story of like that three month window of coming from Kerala to I mean obviously other parts of West Yorkshire too we're not picking on Halifax as you know it's one of my favorite parts of the world but how do you support someone with that culture shock because it's quite an intense thing to happen isn't it um, yes, Fatima, and I think it really links directly to what Tim is saying. Um, actually, it can be quicker than three months in some really? in some places. Yeah, and I think this is where the Stay and Thrive initiative from NHS England Northeast in Yorkshire came about, and we're really proud to say that this is proper Yorkshire project that went sort of regionally to the southwest and now nationally and even in Ireland. We actually start pastoral support from onboarding prior to arrival to the cold yeah. and wet winter gray yes. in, New in, the, in Yorkshire. I mean, especially when it's like minus yeah. two, uh, which might be a bit of a shock for some people. Yeah, we have onboarding uh, onboarding systems in place, Fatima, that's yeah. not just unique to meet Yorkshire because we try to share good practices to other trusts. We give them a preview of what the local place is like. And I assume that Halifax will be doing the same. Yeah. We tell them that the sun sets at four o'clock so that yeah. when they come, they won't be shocked about it. The support comes from even arrival in the airport. Somebody yeah. will actually collect them from there. We actually give them free accommodations up to three months. 
Yeah. That actually ease the transition, especially financially, because there's yeah. implication for every staff. I think more importantly, we just don't do that to the staff themselves. We actually prepare our managers as well, because it's not easy to bridge that gap on cultural awareness. We have various international educated nurses, not just nurses who've expanded to midwives, AHPs, and medics. We have to think about differences from every home countries that they're from as well. We Absolutely, actually get because we're yeah. not a one homogenous group, are we? And even like a country as big as Kerala compared to Mumbai, they're very different, you know? And yeah, and we actually have a lot of colleagues coming from the African continents as well, Fatima, yeah. from the Philippines, from Abu Dhabi. So it's actually a very diverse population that we top in for international recruitment. But I think more importantly, I really want to touch on that belongingness, yes. the inclusive welcome, because it's when we want to really put the focus on retention, because we can just be recruiting day in and day out. But the important thing is for these people to feel that they're actually at home too in the UK so that they will decide to stay. Absolutely, and it goes back to Shirley's point of not only thrive, but feel like you're making a difference. It goes back to Tim's point about the ethical uh, way of bringing somebody over, because it isn't just about the process of physically bringing them into the country. It's about creating that sense of community, that sense of belonging, and sometimes doing the translation of basic things that within Yorkshire we're very, very used to. If you're from even, you know, a country in Africa, say, it's very, very different. You know, a up, uh, you know, and, and sort of the, the cultural Yorkshire way of speaking can sometimes be very difficult to understand if you're not from um, you know, this part of the world. So I think the work that you do is really important. One of the things I was really reflecting on, so I have a role as a non-executive uh, in another trust, and we had an international nurse come to our board and talk a little bit about the pastoral care in particular given to nurses and some of the practical interventions. So going back to your Kerala example, Tim, um, one of the things that I think would be very important to an Indian nurse would be where to watch Bollywood movies, for example, because if you're a Shah Rukh Khan fan like I am, you know, that's the first thing I'm looking for. There's also something practically about where do you get the spices and the right kinds of food and um, geographically where to live, things like how to navigate transport, which are really, really crucial. Mahmood, obviously, my mind is an asset to your organisation. But as a trust, what is the leadership role of your organisation in ensuring not only that we support people to come, but to, to thrive and to make a difference, as Shirley's just said? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I, if I wind back 18 months, um, we had a board seminar where we heard from some international nurses and I was pretty distraught actually it wasn't yeah. it wasn't a good experience and I'm, I'm really proud that as a as an organization and as a board we've really um, supported the growth of this stay and thrive initiative and my my is absolutely a total star within the organization and um, uh, and the team there have done such an amazing job to the extent as you said right at the beginning this is now an hsj award-winning initiative uh, uh, and i think that journey over the last year and a bit i think has been absolutely incredible and i, I came to the uh, sadly my my was ill weren't you you're on the screen and um, i came to the one year on um uh celebration event so, uh, um and that was that was an incredible amount of joy in the room and the sense of community that you saw there and sense of togetherness a sense of belonging and the sense of culture in the positive sense for the organization if you see what i mean the the, yeah. the advocacy for the organization uh it wasn't just we're helping each other it was a genuine love for mid yorkshire that I saw within there and, and even people that had left mid Yorkshire in the NHS and then returned because they loved mid Yorkshire so much and that sense of belonging. That's all down to the the when we start that pastoral care way before our uh, international recruits arrive uh, through to that that bit of the practical stuff of coming and arriving through to that sense of community and you're part of a team, not just yeah. the team you work in, but that wider community yeah. uh, as well that, that, and that support. And if you could bottle that atmosphere in that room, I actually walked out with our, our chief executive and um, it was really striking, I think, just how much that had uh, impacted him as well around thinking about what that positive, it's not just about 
how do we fill vacancies? It's about the positive contribution to the culture of the organisation uh, that we can bring. I think it's really quite special. And we can't underestimate the amount of work that Tim and his team and colleagues like my my do because it isn't just about the transition into a new organisation and a new part of the world and understanding sort of the non-verbals and the verbals of that transition, but also the fact that you may feel that the educational attainment, the professional standards are slightly different, they're harder to navigate, and sometimes they don't feel equal or fair. So there is something about a whole load of work that we are trying to do, and I'm sure Tim and other colleagues are involved about how do you develop capability as well as a sense of belonging and support those individuals to fulfil their potential. Now, Shirley, you are somebody that is working a lot in the academic circles as well as a leader within Bradford, supporting individuals from lots of different sectors, not just health and care, to fulfil their potential. But it is really difficult, isn't it? And people do feel really frustrated that they can't fulfil their potential. And some of the darker side of, of being an international person coming to live and work in West Yorkshire is that they do feel othered and they don't feel valued. So, I mean, share a little bit about your experience. I guess what this conversation is making me think about is we've we've got to keep the the person uh, at the at the centre of all this, and for people will come into our country and into West Yorkshire for many different reasons. Sometimes it might be because um, they get their their heads turned to us because we've deliberately tried to encourage people to come into our 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 workforces. Sometimes it will be because they've got a deep-seated passion to come to a different country and to learn and develop and have opportunities that they don't feel they get where, where they currently are. Sometimes they're coming in because they're seeking asylum. Sometimes they, you know, they want to get out of a very bad situation that they're in. So we've got to have an understanding of the various ways and reasons why people are coming. That helps us understand better their then how we can meet their needs and help them to begin to belong and thrive. Because if if we don't understand that context, we can't be deliberate enough in the mechanisms that we put in place, and we may put the wrong mechanisms in. Um, if we don't pay enough attention to understanding the initial sort of drives, uh, aspirations, et cetera, that people are trying to achieve. And if you don't do that, you know, you might end up with a situation that sometimes we find. I think the year before last, we had something like 4,000 international students come into the university in, 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 in the summer. Um, many had left families behind. Many had struggled to get the income they needed to pay their fees. They couldn't put a deposit down on a house because they're they are a flat. Sorry, because um, you can't do it when you're outside of the country. All of the things that Tim was saying really that can be can be can be blockers. And I think we've also got to understand that whilst they might come primarily for a job or to study or because they're seeking asylum or they come in with a family member, um, that all of their aspects of their lives, um, we, we've got to see the whole thing. So we have to see the intersections of what's it like when you walk out of the hospital ward or out of the ambulance trust, uh, and then you go to the shop and then you go to your flat and then you see somebody in the street. What's the whole experience like? So I think the fact that you're trying to get groups of us together, which are all seeing things from a different angle, um, and, you know, I, I just reminded myself about how many students, the 31,600, I think I'm reading the number now, international students studied in the Yorkshire and the Humber in 2021. That's that is a million. huge amount. And that will be, they'll have been coming for three years, one year, many wanting jobs yeah. in yeah. the healthcare and, and, in, and in other areas. And I think we have to be minded to to, to to just that that intersectionality and being deliberate. And the other thing that came to mind is we're part of the West Yorkshire Anti-Slavery um, Partnership. Yes. You probably you will be as well, no doubt. Um, and when you really listen to some of the experiences that some people have had who have actually been victims of modern slavery, there's all sorts of dimensions to it that we've got to be. Um, I think it was Tim that was talking about ethical practice, morals. Mm -hmm. 
values, etc. Mm. So it's a huge complex landscape that we've got to be deliberately navigating to make it as best as it possibly can be to see the whole person and help them thrive. I mean, so there were so many things that resonated with me when you were speaking, Shirley, unsurprisingly. I think the first thing is how much we can learn from institutions like yours who are very experienced at dealing with international individuals that are coming to the country for a variety of reasons and supporting the transition of, of getting them to settle in, but also um, providing services bespoke to their different needs. And the reason why it really resonates with me is when I was um, at university, not so long ago, people, um, I was um, one of those uh, student workers that would go and collect students from the airport and I'd yeah. bring them to Sheffield and I'd take them to their accommodation and I'd spend a week with them taking them around various places this is where you get this this is where you get that um, but also I was the one that would take them on trips so I'd take them on to, to Manchester United and then take them on the tour of the stadium other football clubs are available etc and, and one of the things that I was really struck by was even in those groups of students the different cultural attitudes so for example one of the the lessons I learned for, uh, was Japanese students don't complain was, and, and I didn't know this. So if I wasn't meeting their needs, they wouldn't tell me. They'd be very quiet, mm. but they'd go and say something on a one-on-one -on -one basis afterwards and I'd hear about it after. Um, or, for example, with uh, students from the South Asian continent that they weren't interested in the same things as Japanese students were. They wanted a slightly different um, expectation, a slightly different need. So I suppose what I'm saying is that even though we're really focused on recruiting lots of people from different parts of the world, one size does not fit all. And your point about person-centred interventions really looking at that person and what the different attributes and facets that make them who they are, what their needs are, and meeting those needs are so important for us, not only as, as institutional academic organisations, but also as health and care employers. One of the things that um, really, really, I think addressed that was your vision, Robin, of uh, being one of the instrumental leaders behind creating West Yorkshire as the first region of sanctuary. Um, and that will not have been an easy journey. Um, because there were lots of different stakeholders that you had to involve as part of that. But there will have been lessons and learning that Mahmood and Mai Mai and Shirley and Tim have shared with you about the good elements of, of coming to a place like West Yorkshire, but also some of the challenges and how becoming a place of sanctuary can support some of those learnings. Yeah, Fatima, I mean, I think um, building on, uh, that's absolutely right, and building on what Shirley said, I mean, everything matters. Everything matters in terms of what people experience, that very first conversation that you described, picking someone up from the airport. But actually, uh, when we described the kind of the reflections of the chief exec about so what leaders say, what leaders do, what leaders focus on, what leaders think is important in those organisations that the new, our new colleagues will be working in matter too. And I I do think that being a place of sanctuary, both in West Yorkshire in terms of the integrated care system, but also our local authorities and um, in our, we've got Upper Calder Valley, as a, we've got even libraries of sanctuary, we've got a cinema of sanctuary, we've got a whole movement which is giving a message that is even on a very, very cold day like this, we are essentially warm, we are welcoming, we have a sense of identity, the AELP, you know, I mean, there is a sense of place and 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 it's at a point when people will be arriving with a real sense potentially in different ways of disconnection, of anxiety, of expectation, maybe really, some excitement. What we say and do, and what we describe as leaders and as colleagues about our place matters. And I think that's about being radical and radically compassionate as leaders. Um, our Calderdale Huddersfield Foundation Trust and our health and care system in Calderdale talk about compassionate leadership. We talk about it across the whole organisation um, and it's about calling out the challenges. It's not saying everything's OK, everything's all fine. Um, you know, we are dealing with the consequences of um, international conflict. You know, people are arriving into places where the cost of living crisis of economic challenges around work, around income, around families around the pressure or the mental health the legacy of the pandemic you know we're coming in to places in tough times um, and there's a real risk of othering there's a real risk of conflict there's a real risk of discontinuity but what we are saying is what what unites us and brings us together is more important we need to have a sense of hope of opportunity of welcoming the new perspectives the new learning that colleagues will bring and actually how it will change our organisations for the good. So um, the whole sense of sanctuary is a place of safety, 
that we aspire to and we're not saying that you know that's not without its challenges um around whether you're walking on the street uh, at night whether you're entering into a situation in your work where you could be anxious about that encounter with a patient or a user of services um, in a context where public service is under a real strain, you know, and where people could immediately be arriving, giving really difficult messages to people that we're working with, you know, and um, and and people can feel angry and it can feel, you know, and and so and, and that can be a massive blow to, you know, sense of I've just arrived and this is am I doing the wrong thing? So it can amplify and how we support colleagues, how we set leadership tone, and, but also more importantly, how we deliver really matters. I mean, this. There's always so much in what you say, Robin, but I think one of the things that I think is a really important message is when people come to West Yorkshire, they come with everything. And that includes baggage of their own lived experience of trauma that they may have experienced in their own country. And then they're coming to a, a very different place that is, as you quite rightly pointed out, experiencing a number of different complex challenges. And that might impact them in a variety of ways. So the leadership that we provide on this agenda is absolutely crucial to the success of those people feeling like they feel safe, that they can thrive and fulfil their potential. But more importantly, just feel safe in their day to day lives, which is, I think, something we all take for granted, but matters more and more. And um, the other thing that you said that I think is really important and one of the reasons I'm so proud to live in West Yorkshire is that we celebrate diversity in its broadest sense. So diversity of heritage, but also diversity of thinking, because one of the benefits of having an international community in West Yorkshire is that new innovative creative ideas, because we don't have all the answers, do we? That's the whole point of having diversity, but also making sure that we recognise the lens of intersectionality. So if you are somebody that is from a different ethnically diverse background, that is coming from a different country, that may experience different layers of inequality, that will treble, quadruple, um, you know, and, and that will impact their ability to stay and thrive. And we need them to stay and thrive because they're absolute assets to our economy. And does need, you know, as a member of the Strategic Race Equality Network and as somebody who works nationally on the agenda of inclusion, I'm sure that the role that you play in supporting from a peer to peer perspective, as well as trying to influence some of the strategic and structural inequalities that we have within our organisations is crucial to addressing some of the challenges that Robin's described. Yeah, um, I'm just sort of um, really interested in what everybody was saying. And um, if I can just join up some little um, pointers that I've sort of um, heard and learned about today and then experienced myself. Um, I, I, I've been working in the NHS, it's sort of nearly 35 years. And um, I remember... Surely not, Tasneem, surely not. Yeah, darling. it's me, it's the me, me cream that does it. Um, I remember in my early nursing uh, sort of career, there was um, Filipino nurses, you know, uh, that were working alongside us. So um, that cohort of colleagues has been around for uh, quite a while. And if I come forward to a more recent experience, Tim, you know, the um, Car Carolyn nurses that you've just mentioned, uh, I'm sure it must be from that pool that we've got some in our 111 in uh, you know, and I, I hadn't I hadn't been aware that there was a, a programme. Similarly, it, it, for the ambulance sector in Yorkshire, we've we've recruited from Australia and um, the support mechanism that my Mai was describing in terms of the um, supporting conversations when colleagues are abroad and then um, picking them up, you know, sorting out accommodation, mentorship locally um, is something I've sort of seen happen in, in Yorkshire. And I know at a more national level, um, for example, London, I know London have ex um, recruited from other countries and some of those colleagues have, have not had a positive experience, um, you know, coming into the sector and I think it is the more visibly different you are uh, maybe the more the more struggle that is there so um the one of the things I was thinking about is there these individuals have got these touch points of support but a lot of the time they're on their own and how how do they survive with the multiple layers of complexity that they are uh, dealing with and I uh, you know I've got a personal uh, experience of a family member who 
was a student and is now part of our family and um, just just how they're accommodating uh, to this life and this world. So for me, um, um, because I'm also involved in staff and support networks, they have a role. So at a, a local level at Yorkshire, I'm thinking we need to um, reach out to those uh, nurses and say, look, our, our network is also here. And then sort of at the West Yorkshire level, we've got the Strategic Race Equality Network. And I think for us, what we could do is learn from each other because mid Yorkshire, your your brilliant experience that you're talking about here. Um, my my experience was in and around Leeds previously. So what's Leeds doing? Leeds is a massive hospital. They will have experiences and other acute trusts. So it's, you, you know, looking at the best of the best. Um, and, and saying, OK, this works. These are the principles, but this is what will make it even even better. And um, just then then also linked with the um, sort of my own you know, national uh, work in the ambulance world. It is about how you um, try and create some of those support systems and um, inform leaders of things that are, are not working. So it is supporting people at different different levels. I mean, there is so much in mm -hmm. this conversation. Some of the themes that we're already hearing is, you know, the power of networks, the power of lived experience to lead change, the power and actions of leaders on this agenda, about the power of collaboration and the power of actually living through your values and that authentic, compassionate you know, leadership that can support and create inequality or inclusivity in a much more powerful way than we could ever imagine. But I've only got you for a little while longer, so I'm going to ask you all one final question before we bring this conversation to a close, always leaving our viewers and our listeners with a little bit more. Um, if you could do one thing differently, or if you could encourage individuals to do one thing differently on this agenda, what would it be? Or if there is an initiative or an example of good practice that you want people to adopt, what would it be? So I am going to go to the man with all the answers first, which is Robin. Oh, no I pressure. Thought, I thought you'd give me more time. I, I, no, I man, you, time you've got the answer to this. this. Well, there's a lot of things, aren't there? Um, I, 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 there's something for me about celebrating success and celebrating the learning that we we achieve through the knowledge we have from people that arrive at this scale uh, across our places. And um, we need to do more to tell the stories. We need to tell the story. So I, you know, we literally had two young men that walked from Afghanistan to Halifax, you know, and they wrote, uh, and we wrote a play about it with Square Chapel, we, with St Augustine Centre, and we told the story of that journey, um, coming from the, the context of their lives and making that journey. And we need to tell more about the story and see it as kind of part of the, the I guess, the wealth of our organisations and our places. So I suppose let's let's pick up some of those examples. Let's celebrate them. Let's let's shout about them. The fact that th this can be contested space, the fact that people can sometimes worry about, I suppose, let's not let fear immobilise us and let's tell the story of of um, uh, of belonging and what it means to belong in West Yorkshire. Thanks. I mean, one of the lessons I learned from you, Robin, was very much numbers tell a story, but they're never as impactful as the story of the human lived experience. And you framed that so beautifully. Shirley, as another person with infinite wisdom, what are your thoughts? <laughs> well, um, I think that as leaders in this space, we need to be deliberate and really conscious really, really conscious of the value that international people add to our um, organisations and to our economy. So international students actually underpin the success of UK universities. And that is recognised and not recognised at the same time. So my one thing would be for leaders to be more engaged politically and to get into positions where they can have meaningful um, and challenging discussions with policymakers to make sure that what we do does not prevent people from genuinely coming for the right reasons to engage with our organisations for the good of the organisations and the individuals and see things beyond 
um, bean counting in relation to trying to get the um, immigration um, numbers down because my the big thing I'm really hinting at here is I definitely feel that international students should not be counted um, in 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 those in those figures. So I, for me, the one thing is I think we yet yeah, do everything we can to be good leaders, to be compassionate leaders, but we've got to be engaged more politically. Absolutely, and there's a. I mean, one of the things I've always said about West Yorkshire is we are so influential because of our courage and our innovation. Um, and we need to harness that much more proactively, particularly in this space, Shirley. You're yeah. absolutely right. And the one thing that did make me think when somebody was chatting, I don't know what they're saying, but the Laura Serrant, Serrant um, poem came to mind. You know, you, you asked, um, we came, and we're still asking, and people are still coming, whether it's for education or jobs. And we must, must not take that, take that sentiment away from our thinking. Absolutely. I mean, I love that you asked, we came. I say that a lot in a variety of different contexts, but very wise words, as always. Tim, if you if you had the gift, what would be your suggestion? I think something a little bit similar to, to colleagues so far, really, in terms of uh, how we really support our international workforce to um, to bring their unique experiences and um, education they've had experience from other, other countries to their to their roles uh, in this country and within our system as well and um, there's an organization organization we work with called thet tropical health education trust who did a great study called experts in our midst that really celebrated the work of our of our international international colleagues but, but also said people don't always get the opportunity to sort of share things that they they know in situations they've they've seen in other in other in other settings that could be really a benefit to us in in solving our problems here um so and by, by identifying what more ways to do this, we're going to create great opportunities for people to develop, um, just uh, become leaders, strengthen existing partnerships we have between West Yorkshire and other, other global systems, and um, introduce us to, to new partnerships as well. So just really just try and strengthen the work around that. I mean, we, we do love a good partnership in West Yorkshire, don't we? It is very much the West Yorkshire way. Um, another West Yorkshire way, and uh, very much a Fatima mantra, is pinching with pride, Tazneen. As you know, I do love pinching with pride. What is your uh, one thought suggestion? I'm going to bring it back down to a basic level. So for me, there is something about, we've referenced sort of uh, compassionate conversations a number of times. And um, I'm sort of thinking of Michael uh, West's words about, you know, listen with fascination. Oh, I and do actually, love Michael West. Yeah. And, and it is about listening and, and making connections with people. I think at, at a human level, if we can make somebody feel wanted and you know that we're actually genuinely caring for them I think that's a great comp contribution to humanity so for me it's that you know basic level absolutely and sometimes mm. it's the most basic things that are the most impactful aren't they mm, yeah uh, Mahmood do you, are you someone who listens with fascination I am um and, and interestingly um uh, and very timely, it, it, yesterday um, I, I attended my first uh, board meeting at Chesterfield Royal and uh, the anti-racism strategy was brought to the public board, yes. which um, was a big, yes, a big attraction for me of, of why Chesterfield as well. And uh, I thought it just might be in terms of what can leaders do? I thought the summary of that conversation was fascinating. Uh, and this is kind of what I say, you know, it, 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 it's it's about listening. You know, we talked about listening. It's about listening. Do we really know what our colleagues think? Do we know what it feels like uh, for them? And, and that board seminar I referenced 18 months ago was the catalyst for our leadership team to then want to do something differently. And and it's not just about listening. It's that's passive. It's about going to find out uh, as well, not just waiting to, to for someone to say something and then act on it. And that's the key thing. What are we going to do as a leadership team? Uh, and, you know, my saying is, you know, this is not a spectator sport. This is a participation sport. Uh, Anti-racism is different to not being racist. Uh, and I think for, lead, for a leadership team, we need to do something. And if we can get this right and measure that by how does it feel for our staff, then you create this sense of belonging, not just for that group of staff, but actually culturally for all staff. And that's why this is such a vital topic. I mean, th there was a couple of things that occurred to me while you were talking. The first thing is we've got to stop 
doing to people uh, and not just people that are coming to this country from internationally different parts of the world but people that are living in the grassroots of West Yorkshire right now I mean the biggest game-changing moment of my life was when the Jedi warrior known as Rob Webster the chief executive of West Yorkshire Health and Care Partnership said you know what come and help us co-create the solution oh my god did that change my whole life and I hope the trajectory of West Yorkshire too in some ways so there is something about empowering people to act and also, in the immortal words of Elvis, um, a little less conversation, a little more action, please, is always a good thing to do, too. And um, my my, as the embodiment of the power of lived experience, what are your thoughts on what more we could do? One thing, Fatima, that I tell everyone that I meet each and every day from our international workforce is to be brave to come and bring your own self to work. Yeah. Be authentic. It's the only time when you accept truly who you are that people can accept who you are. And I wish I was brave enough to be that 22 years ago. It took me a while because we didn't have the support that we have today. I wouldn't have imagined that I'll be here on this platform speaking to you during my time. However, they are gifted with the opportunity now, with what Tim is doing, with what you're doing, what Robin is doing. It is the best time to do something positive to the future because the NHS is a very diverse workforce and we need to take care of that so that we can also bridge health inequalities in the community that we serve. Thank Absolutely. you for having me today. No, I mean, what a beautiful way to end this conversation. And, uh, you know, one of the inspirational phrases that I always had from the uh, sadly no longer with us, Joe Cox, was we've got more in common than that that divides us. And diversity is one of the benchmarks that makes the NHS the amazing NHS. And we need to focus on that. Um, what an incredible conversation, guys, uh, and, and a really great opportunity to, to do what this podcast does best, really, which is to start a conversation about leaving people to think differently and also to keep the conversation going outside of this podcast. So please do continue this conversation, um, like and subscribe this podcast, but also more importantly, keep the conversation going on those different platforms with the hashtag WY Inclusion. A huge thank you to all our incredible panel members. Uh, thank you for your time and your contributions. And it's a goodbye from me and it's a goodbye from them. Thanks everyone. Mm -hmm.